So today we'll be talking about uh, ransomware attacks versus other types of attacks, um, the similarities and uh, key differences between the two. Um, spoiler, there's a lot of similarities, but there are some really good key uh, differences that we'll talk about. Um, so who am I? Um, I'm you know, Devin Hill. I'm the director of digital forensics for, uh, for digital silence as of the last few months. Uh, prior to that, I have worked for, uh, I've, I've, you know, worked for uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, Trace Point, Stroh Friedberg, uh, mostly doing uh, insurance panel work, so lots and lots and lots of ransomware. Uh, conservatively, I've probably acted as a tech lead or assisted with analysis of at least 50 ransomware engagements. Well, you know, just, just as a conservative estimate, probably. Um, I've been working in DFIR for about seven years. Um, I haven't, you know, chased a bunch of certifications, but I, I do have a master's in digital forensics and cyber investigation from University of Maryland, so there's that. <laughs> so, um, quick introduction, you know, um, if I cannot press the wrong button. Um, so, you know, as we know, ransomware on, uh, uh, attacks are on the rise year after year, or maybe they're not, you know, according to one of our earlier talks there. But, um, you know, at most statistics will say that they're on the rise, so we'll go with that. Um, so it's important to understand the different challenges that you're going to be presented when you're doing like a ransomware engage or a, a investigation versus you know other types of investigations. Um, but to kind of set some ground rules, like when I when I was doing some research for this and trying to kind of put this together, um, you know, I, I realized that this could go on for days if I don't kind of narrow the scope. So um, we're going to discuss ransomware groups in general terms. So you know. Well, it'll, you know, if I say most ransomware groups, I'm not talking about every ransomware group, obviously, uh, because they all operate differently and there are hundreds of them out there and, you know, they're just constantly doing different things. So um, we're also going to focus on, uh, like, just general system intrusion attacks. I'm not going to go into, like, cloud-based attacks, business email compromise. Uh, we're not going to talk about, like, every single type of crimeware, banking, Trojan, everything else. We're just mainly going to stick with, like, hands-on keyboard, you know, type of attacks. So, um, quick introduction to the kill chain. I'm sure everybody's familiar with it at this point. Um, you know, I know it's not everybody's favorite framework, but it, you know, will kind of cover what we need for this for this talk. Um, you know, it's, and for those that may not be familiar with it, it's just a seven-step uh, process that kind of helps narrow down like each part of the attack. So. Um, so we'll move right into the similarities between uh, ransomware and other types of attacks. As I said, there's there's a lot of similarities, and I'll, I'll kind of move through this quickly because we've talked through, through these a lot of these tactics and techniques, you know, through the other talks. So I won't go into these too deeply. But um, so as far as the reconnaissance phase goes, you know, it's it's just like any APT group. They they they're going to choose their target, and some of them, you know, some of the ransomware groups, they may be targeting a specific group or a specific organization. Um, like they see, you know, a big payoff, so they'll they'll attack like a certain group. But most of the time, it's just they randomly scan for vulnerabilities. They see something, and they go for it. So um, once they've done that, they'll do like vulnerability scans to uh, outline the attack surface, figure out what they can get into and what they can't, and um, see if there's any big red flags that'll just allow them right into the network. Um, this is where they'll also do like intel gathering if they're going to do like a spear phishing campaign against the targeting or organization or, you know, use other sorts of uh, social engineering attacks, this is where they're, they're going to put together that information. Or, you know, they, they may skip directly to, you know, the win button, basically. They're going to they're gonna skip straight to the, the uh, actions on objectives phase by just buying access from one of those access brokers that were discussed earlier. Um, so then next we have weaponization. So here they're, here's where they're going to construct phishing messages uh, based on the information that they gathered earlier. They're gonna they're gonna prepare their droppers, configure their their remote web shells, you know things like that, um, or they're gonna like comprom infect compromised sites or create a fake site to distribute malware. Um, we see that fairly commonly, really. Uh, delivery. Um, this is where they're actually gonna send those phishing messages. They're gonna drop a web shell under a vulnerable web server. I'm sure we've all heard the word proxy shell or seen it a hundred thousand times at this point. Um, or, you know, the user is going to visit a compromised site that downloads a dropper that's then going to move on to the next phase here. Um, so as far as exploitation, you know, this is where, like, if a user clicks that phishing message, it's going to drop something on their system and, and, uh, and start doing nasty things. <laughs> um, 
This is where like a TA may send the, the call to activate the web shell that they, they pushed down earlier. Um, this is also where uh, we see this one a lot, sadly. Um, you know, that where we, I don't think we should it in 2022 at this point, but you see a lot of open RP, RDP to the internet. And then there's, you know, they brute force and they get into the, the network that way. Or another big one that we've seen, and I won't name any names, but um, there's, you know, RD, RC uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities and a lot of firewalls out there that they can just dump the whole VPN credential database, a brute force that back on their systems, you know, in Russia or wherever they are. And then they've got your credentials. And then a lot of the times those credentials are reused on the network. So they can just go in and start moving around the network right away, like directly VPN in and then RDP into the systems and go to town. Um, so installation, this is where, you know, when the user, you know, they open the phishing email. So now they're going to, uh, they're going to actually open the executable that was in the email or the ISO file with the link file or, you know, whatever else that they're pushing out there. Um, this is where they, they'll use the web shell and then they push down a back door to, to there to give them, you know, to give them access afterwards. Um, or they, you know, in this case, a, a download, uh, the down dropper that was downloaded elsewhere from the website, you know, will pull down a backdoor or they'll even just, you know, they'll manually install a backdoor via RDP connection, which often, you know, as we, you know, heard a few times now today, uh, Cobalt Strike is a big one for that. Oh, excuse me. Um, and so one thing that was, I, th I think it was uh, Harlan talked about earlier is where, um, or Brian, I'm sorry, I've kind of mixing up the talks now, but one of them was talking about how like the kill chain and all these various frameworks are kind of fuzzy where, you know, it's like, so when I say like this all happens in installation there, and then we move on to the command and control uh, section next, but you know, right here where, you know, you're already seeing some command and control, like when the web shell reaches out, grab a back door or the dropper goes out, reaches out to C2, pulls down a back door. So there's there's a couple of different phases of command and control, I guess, where I, I like the, the terms like primary and secondary command and control, which is kind of good. Um, so that's where we move into next, though, is um, that the, uh, like a dropper will establish communications with C2, and then the, they pull down a backdoor, and then that backdoor can also go out and establish command and communi or command and control. So um, or like then the backdoor also establishes communications with the C2 server to allow the threat actor access to the system. So um, here's where it gets a little bit different, and this is where you know it's a little bit more. Uh, I'll, I'll focus a little bit more here, but um, this is where you know the, the actions on objectives is where you know, as you probably know, the, the threat actor goes hand full hands on keyboard to accomplish whatever their goal may be. And so this is where threat uh, ransomware and APT groups differ by quite a bit. Um, you know, most, uh, but th there is a common thread, and that's ch typically extortion. Um, so a lot of, a couple of years ago, or you know, a year or two ago anyway, uh, most ransomware groups realized that if you just encrypt everybody, if you would just encrypt all the data on a network, maybe the client doesn't care, or maybe the victim doesn't care. Maybe they just, you know, they can restore it for backups, or they just, okay, we lost data. You know, I guess we'll have to rebuild that. And so they, they wouldn't always pay the ransoms. So these groups, you know, thought, hey, if we steal a bunch of data and threaten to leak it, you know, maybe then they'll start paying us and what? Well, I think that's worked from my experience in a lot of cases. So, um, so, so what they'll do is they just steal as much data as they possibly can, bundle it up, and then you know threaten to leak that data or sell it, you know, on the on the dark web, you know, if if uh, you don't pay up. So, um, and you know, obviously that's not good for them because you know the this can cause a lot of damage to the victim's rep reputation, and they, they can incur fines and penalties from various regulatory agencies and you know, come run into all kinds of fun issues. So, uh, but then, you know, state-sponsored state, state -sponsored APT groups may also use stolen data to ex extort politicians or other high-value targets, as they may call it. Um, for just a quick example, you know, they may steal information on, like, a politician, find out, you know, something that the politician doesn't want to get out, and then, you know, they can use that to, to they, they can go to the politician and say, hey, you know, we know that this thing about you, and if you, you know, if, if you don't vote this way to remove sanctions from our country or do whatever it is that we want you to do, we'll release that data and, you know, it's not going to work out real well for you. So, as I, you know, as I said, uh, extortion is the main, the, the main common thread between, you know, ransomware groups and, and other uh, APT groups. 
Um, so from here, I'll, I'll move on to the, the differences. Um, and you know, we won't go through the whole kill chain again because you know, as I said, this is that's very similar. There's there's not much of a difference between the two on those. Um, so the big thing with with uh, ransomware groups is their their methodology is a little bit more smash and grab. They're not they're not trying to get in there. They're not trying to be really quiet. Um, they're not they're they're not being terrifically sneaky. They're they're just getting in there, and they're using they're they're using PS exec to, to move across the network. They're dumping LSAS. They're running MIMI cats. They're they're running Cobalt Strike all over the network to move around. They're RDPing into things. They may be using just any desk or or, or connect wise or any of these really obvious tools that probably shouldn't be running on the network and should be easily caught but aren't. So. Um, They'll, they'll also use like AD find to, to do active directory reconnaissance and, and pull different, uh, just find all your users and, and just do a whole reconnaissance on your network. So um, like a lot of APT groups, they don't use these type of tools very often, like just because they're, they're really loud and obvious. So they're going to use more customized tools. They're going to use more um, stealthy methods for exfiltration rather than just using, you know, at mega.nz or, you know, I've, I've seen threat actors just install FileZilla and just SFTP stuff out of the network. Like, they just don't care. <laughs> so, um, you know, they, they, we've seen that kind of thing a lot. So, um, where, you know, obviously, like, the, the um, APT groups are going to use, you know, more, like, they're, you know, you hear about, like, where they, they hide packets and DNS traffic and all kinds of fun things like that, where ransomware groups, I've, I've literally never seen that happen. So... <laughs> I, I'm not saying it hasn't, but you know it's it's pretty uncommon. Um, I still can't hit the right buttons here. So um, and another big thing is like a like ransomware groups. They're not really going to use zero days on this kind of thing. Like unless unless you're like you know the Garmin breach recently. I don't even think they used one there. But you know unless you're like a huge high value target and they're like a really sophisticated ransomware group. They're not going to be using. They're not going to be wasting zero days just to you know drop ransomware on your network. So you're you're more likely just going to see really common CVEs being exploited. Like you know, like I said, like the the RCE thing with VPNs. Uh, you're going to see a lot more just brute forcing RDP systems. You're going to see you know proxy shell being dropped on exchange servers left and right. So like you're not really going to you're not really going to be digging for you know really stealthy zero day methods of uh, of exploitation here. Um, and and this is a lot of this is just because they're they're going for low hanging fruit. They're not really they're not often going for those big targets. And there's so many like low hang, there's so many low hanging fruit out there that they don't even have to really get to those you know like the, the larger targets in a lot of cases. Um, so the big one of the big takeaways here is that a lot of these tactics like result in a much lower dwell time than than APT groups and other types of attacks. Um, the, like the the 2022 Sophos Advertor adversary uh, playbook says, you know that the, the ransomware attacks have about a 15 day dwell time, as opposed to 34 for other non ransomware attacks. But I mean, I've seen I've seen several hours of dwell time where they just get in and they do recon on the network. They see there's not a whole lot there and they just fire off ransomware. Or um, you know, we, we uh, one of the talks earlier he, he mentioned that you know the threat actor was active for five days and then they were out. So. Um, you know, so they're they're not really uh, they're not in there for a very long time, and um, yeah, I think there I, I had something else there. I think, but um, so another big difference with this with with ransomware engagements is that you may actually actually have to communicate with the threat actor. You know, you're not you're not going to do this in a in an APT attack for sure, um, where. But in, in this case, if you you know if you get if you're a ransomware victim and you need to get your files decrypted, you actually have to negotiate with the threat actor. Like you have to, they'll provide a link in the the ransom note. You actually have to go to that link and then talk to the threat actor, and, and you can try to negotiate a price with them for the decryptor and or to prevent them from you know leaking the stolen data. And then once that's complete, they'll provide a link to the files they stole for the victim to download and review. But as we saw that, you know, that that's not always the, the full bulk of the files that were stolen, but so you can't always completely trust that. But um, and but this is this is kind of an important part, because if you mess this up, I've, I've seen clients where, you know, they 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 would 
contact the threat actor before contacting their insurance, and then you know the insurance would call us to begin an investigation. And by then, they've already pissed off the threat actor, and the threat actor's like, I'm not giving you anything. So um, at that point, you better hope you have a really good negotiator to walk that back if you need to you know, get the decryptor or prevent them from leaking your data. So, um, but another, another big thing as part of these uh, threat actor communications and, and ransomware payments is the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which we, I believe they talked a little bit about the, in the panel earlier, where you have to make sure that a, a threat actor isn't a sanctioned entity, which can be difficult. So, um, and, and not doing so can, you know, result in prison time and fines if you pay a sanctioned entity. So it's, you know, in your best interest to make sure that this process is done properly. Um, so, you know, there's, there are companies that will handle this for you if, if you'd prefer not to do it yourself and, and make sure all that's done right. So, um, so that, that can be very important as well. Uh, so let's see. We'll move on to the, the, the reasons for differences for these differences are that, you know, a lot of this is just because ransomware actors are in it for the money. They, they want to get in. They want to, they, they want to damage the network and flick fear that you're going to, they're going to leak your data and they just want to get paid. So, and they're, they're not really worried about getting caught because if you catch them, they'll just ditch that one and move on to the next. They don't, they don't particularly care a lot unless you're, you know, unless you're like a larger, uh, a larger organization, then they may keep coming back and they, they, I, I've actually worked cases where the, the, like the threat actor came in, they, they owned ESXi, they owned the whole network and they were going wild in there. And then as we're doing our investigation, we start seeing the threat actor coming back because, and, and re-encrypting things because they knew that they were going to get a huge payout if they could keep that network encrypted and keep us from kicking them out. So, um, so, you know, you will have those at times, but they're pretty rare. I think I've worked two cases like that ever out of easily 50 or more. So, um, but, you know, as mentioned earlier, there's, there's, they're, they're working with a target rich environment. So if they get caught, they don't really care that much. They just move on to the next one and, you know, probably not get caught. So they're, they're going to get their money one way or another eventually. But, um, and another thing is that they, they tend to be in, like, like located in Russia or other countries without extradition treaties. And so if they get caught, they're not going to get arrested. They don't care. I think there's, there's actually, um, basically the Russian government's not going to do anything about it. And as long as they're not attacking like Russian, like Russian, uh, citizens or, or organizations, they don't really care. There's even uh, a lot of ransomware will actually have, you know, if the system language is in Russian or other Cyrillic based languages, just don't execute. And so, um, and, and so there's, there's a free security tip. Just change all your systems to Russian and you'll be, you know, you'll be all right. <laughs> might, might make uh, operations a little bit more difficult, but you won't get ransomware. So, um, but then, you know, as far as state, state sponsored, uh, APT groups and, and other groups, they're not really looking to make money so much, but they're, they're looking to steal data for like government use. Or uh, like they could maybe looking for like weapon or vehicle aircraft plans, whatever that they can use to look for weaknesses, or they can even copy to improve their their own uh, weapons. Um, the, and they, you know, we've even seen this where, uh, and a lot of them, they're they're just looking to steal data on like an industry, like a like. I mean, we've seen like the 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 U.S. steel industry after China broke into like U.S. steel and stole a lot of their data, and now, you know, look where our steel industry is, and versus China's and. So they're, they're looking to, you know, steal that kind of data that they can use to improve their, their military or their economy in most cases. Um, so, um, whatever the reasoning is, they don't really want to get caught and they don't want to leave a trace. Like they don't, they don't want you to know that like Russia has now has all your data or China has all your data. They just, they, they, they don't even want you to know that anybody took it really. Um, so these, these type of attacks are more likely to use like zero days and custom type tools that are going to fly under the radar of even the most vigilant defenders. So, um, but then, then you've also got, um, hacktivist APT groups that, you know, they, they don't really, they're not really looking for money generally. Their, their primary data or primary objectives are to steal data so that they can like expose corruption or other misdeeds and to, you know, to punish those responsible. Um, they're also known for hacking sites and they'll deface them to spread their messages or whatever it may be. 
Um, these guys also really want to fly under the radar typically because they're, they're doing these in their own country and, you know, they don't want to end up in prison as, you know, as like a political prisoner. So they tend to, uh, they, they, they tend to fly under the radar a little bit more. Um, so let's see. So next we've got like the key takeaways here, the, um, from those, from those major differences. Uh, so the, the biggest thing is with the dwell time being so short, it, it's like monitoring your network is incredibly important. And given the vast, the, given that the vast majority of these are, you know, attacks are using incredibly noisy tools, um, you know, a well-monitored EDR platform should catch them in their tracks incredibly early in the process. Um, especially, you know, even if it doesn't catch the initial exploit, once they go hands on keyboard, if your EDR is not catching Mimikatz or Cobalt Strike, then you probably need to talk to a representative because <laughs> it's not really acceptable. So, um, you know, so like they, they should be catching, like I said, you know, they should be catching things like Mimikatz, Cobalt Strike, unauthorized uses of PS exec. Um, Mimikatz and Cobalt Strike, they don't really have a legit purpose outside of like a pen test, maybe. So, you know, those should throw huge red flags. Um, and, and, you know, PS exec obviously is like a, a benign tool in some ways you can use it, you know, legitimately in your network, but that should also be documented. So if you see unauthorized PS exec usage, then, you know, you should be seeing like raising a red flag right away and, and dealing with that. So, you know, and, and like there's obvious indicators like, you know, that I'm sure we, a lot of us have seen the, the uh, base 64 blob of PowerShell code that begins with JBZ. And that, if that doesn't, you know, uh, that, and, and like uh, Harlan said earlier, that should be a big slap in the face to any analyst that sees that. So, um, and then the, the other big takeaway here is that uh, threat actor communications add another layer of recovery uh, to recovery efforts that most organizations may not be ready for. Um, if your organization is affected by a ransomware attack, I highly en recommend engaging a third party team, not only for the, the uh, investigation and recovery efforts, but for these threat actor communications. And, um, and also I th somebody brought up uh, earlier, you know, uh, dealing with law enforcement and they may not have time to do that while they're trying to recover. And that's, a, that's something else like a third party can assist with. And I, I, uh, I, I, I don't know how many of those FBI forms I've filled out with, you know, various indicators of compromise and things like that, that they want. So, um, you know, that's, that's something else that we can kind of assist with. Um, but, you know, going back to the threat actor communications, um, you know, like I said, if, if you, if you negotiate poorly with them, you may end up paying a much higher ransom than necessary. You may not, you know, you may not actually get a decryptor. You may not get your, you may, you may just like, you may, you know, anger them and they'll just leak your data right away. They don't, you know, they don't care. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's covers pretty much everything. I didn't have a final slide there. So, <laughs> uh, any questions, comments, anything? <laughs> I won't say it doesn't happen, but I've I've never seen like direct evidence of that happening. Uh, usually, you know, it's usually we don't see like where they originally get the access from, right? Like whether it's a vulnerability scan or if it's whether they purchase the access or whatever. Like we don't generally see that part. We just generally see from like exploitation on most of the time. The other questions or anything? Um, I don't believe so. He's basically asking like if if a threat actor has gained like a foothold into a network and realized it's either there's there's nothing really worth moving laterally to take or um, or if, if they just kind of give up and like move on or if. I mean, I have seen where like it, they'll they'll hit a network that's really small and they don't bother taking any data or anything else. And they just fire off the ransomware and hope maybe they pay the ransom and they get a few bucks out of it. But um, I, I haven't really we, like because generally, if if you know that were to happen, the client's not going to get alerted to it and they're not going to call us anyway. So and and so um, yeah, so they, they like we haven't really seen that too much or at all really. Yeah. Oh, so I can't reach the command and control servers. Yeah. Um, we have seen that. I haven't seen it in like an incident response engagement so much because it's another one of those where if it never gets to a point where it, it alerts the customer, they're not going to know. But we've seen that kind of thing with like threat hunting engagements or like monitoring EDR tools, where you know you'll see like you'll you'll see like 
like the the back door hit and it'll try to reach out and it just can't all right then <laughs>